Welcome everyone. Good morning. I see people already super active in the chat. We're so excited to have you here. My name is Marilyn Alvarez. I am the Family and Community Engagement Manager with Board District 7 and Ms. Tanya Ortiz Franklin. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Students as Voters event, inspiring the next generation of voters. A very, very timely um, subject. So we're very excited that you all are here with us um, to gain some knowledge, to meet your elected officials, and to ask a lot of questions. Next slide, please. So before we get started and jump in, uh, we want to know uh, if you can share your name, your school, and answer the question, why is voting an important responsibility? So if you can all just take maybe a quick 30 seconds to a minute, share your name, your school, where are you joining us from, and why is voting an important responsibility? Why should we vote, basically? So we'll start. Again, the chat is open. I see so many people responding. We're so excited to have you all. Um, so yeah, give us some thoughts. Let us know. What do you think? Um, yeah, and shout out your school. Don't forget to do that. We have Garcetti Learning Academy. We have some elementary school students here. Super excited. Uh, Gil Garcetti, okay. Gil Garcetti is representing this morning. Uh, we also have Denker, amazing. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, so we're saying voting is important um, because we get better results. Yes, absolutely. All right, a lot of shout outs from Denker and um, Garcetti. Any other schools here? That's awesome. Wow. We need a good leader. That is why voting is important. Absolutely. And I would say good leaders, plural, right? Absolutely. Yes. All right. A lot of, a lot of, uh, oh, Eagle Tree, Perry Middle School. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. Keep, keep, um, keep adding in the chat. We'll be um, reviewing and we'll be answering questions throughout. So please continue to share, uh, share in the chat. All right. Next slide. All right, so our objectives, what do we hope to accomplish today? Um, first, you all, our LAUSD students, will connect with elected representatives to learn about the importance of engaging in the political process. So we'll spend some time doing that today. Uh, that's one of our goals today. The other one was for you all students to learn about policies that directly impact you. So want to make sure uh, that you leave today feeling uh, a lot of getting a lot of knowledge and also understanding a lot about um, the policies that are in place and you know how they affect your daily life. Uh, next slide. And we do have some norms. Uh, if you've attended some of our events before, we always start with norms. Uh, the first one is be engaged. And I see the chat just on fire. So that's wonderful. We hope that continues. That is a great sign that you are engaged. So uh, aim to be present. Uh, make sure that you are engaged. Any point throughout the whole uh, event that you feel like you have a question, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, so we'll be pulling your questions as our speakers are presenting. And we want to make sure that you know this is your event. And so we want to hear from you. So ask all your questions. There's different ways to participate. We love our Zoom reactions. Obviously, we love our chat. If you have a burning question and you really, really want to unmute, just raise your hand and we'll call on you. And then the other thing that I think is really important for an event like the one today uh, is that you'll hear different perspectives. So it's really important to embrace both and thinking, right? So different ways and different perspectives. And we welcome all of them. And we want to make sure that you do as well. All right, and with that, I am going to turn it over to our friends um, at the American Constitution Society. Um, I'll hand it over to Gabriela uh, as they will moderate part of the event. So hand it, hand it over to Gabriela, thank you. Thank you so much, Marilyn, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Gabriela Barbosa. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. I actually would like my two colleagues who are here with me today to quickly introduce themselves, and then I'll introduce myself and move on to um, the moderated portion of our conversation. So I'd like to invite Mark and Indira to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Bolin. I'm a board member uh, at the Los Angeles chapter of American Constitution Society. 
Uh, I am an attorney in Burbank. I work at a law firm, Resnick and Lewis. Thank you everyone for being involved, for being here. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the students. Uh, I'm so excited for this event. And uh, again, we'll hand it over to Indira now to introduce herself. Good morning, everybody. My name is Indira. I am an attorney. I have my own law firm here in Los Angeles. And I have some kids that are also in LAUSD. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much, Mark and Indira. So again, good morning, everyone. My name is Gabriella. I am uh, the co-chair of the American Constitution Society, the Los Angeles Lawyer Chapter. In my day job, I'm also a lawyer. I work at a children's rights organization called the Children's Partnership. But moving back to the American Constitution Society, so who is the American Constitution Society? We are a national organization of law students, lawyers, judges, and others who share a progressive vision of law and policy. Um, and through the American Constitution Society, we're really working to uphold the Constitution Society and ensure that law is a force that protects people and improves their lives. <clears throat> so part of this work includes partnering with school board members like board member Franklin Ortiz and also working with our elected officials. So thank you so much to board member Ortiz Franklin, um, as well as assembly member Gibson and supervisor Mitchell for being part of this event with us and for planning this. And thank you also to the teachers and students who joined us this morning. So we're going to start with the uh, moderate portion of our conversation. So if I could please ask for people who aren't speaking to mute, um, just so there's no interference that goes on. Um, so if we can change to the next slide, please. Great. So we'll start by asking each, um, each panelist uh, to go around and introduce themselves, share their name, their position, and how long they've been in, in office. Um, and then we'll quickly move to a round of other questions, a fun civics quiz for you all. And we'll also have time for students to ask their questions that may come up. So please feel free to, as Marilyn said, continue putting any questions that you have into the chat. Uh, so board member Ortiz Franklin, if we can start with you, please share your name, your position, how long you've been in office. Yes, good morning scholars. We are so glad to see you on this day before an election day. I'm Tanya Ortiz Franklin, your school board member for LA Unified District 7 from San Pedro through the Harbor area up through Gardena where I live and through South LA. It's so glad, I'm so glad to see you here this morning. I will tell you um, a little bit more about me and my journey during our conversations today, but I am um, I'm just really excited for the opportunity to share with you a little bit about serving as your newest LA Unified School Board member. I was elected in November of 2020. I started in December, so I'm about nine months in, and I hope to serve all three terms for four years each and get to see you all graduate through high school and college and maybe even attend some of your graduations. We're so grateful you're here, and thank you to Supervisor Mitchell and assembly member Gibson for joining us as well. Thank you so much board member Ortiz Franklin. If we can move on to um, supervisor Mitchell, if you can please share your name, position and how long you've been in office. Good morning, happy to and it's really a pleasure to be with you all today. So I am um, supervisor for the LA County Board of Supervisors the most powerfully elected body in the country. It's five of us, happens to be five women that have jurisdiction over 10 million LA County residents. My district has 2 million. That's what makes it the most powerfully elected body because of the size of our districts. We represent more people than all, but I think it's six or seven like states. So LA County is massive in terms of its size and the um, public policy and the county departments we uh, oversee. I was just elected to this new position this past November, but prior to that, I um, spent 10 years in the California legislature. I was three years in the assembly, seven years in the Senate, um, was proud to uh, chair the Senate Budget Committee um, for four years. That's my elected history. Thank you so much, Supervisor Mitchell. It's great to have you with us. And Assembly Member Gibson, if you can introduce yourself as well. Great, thank you very much, buenos dias. Good morning to each and every one of you. I wanna thank um, Tanya um, Ortiz Franklin, school board member of District 7, which I live in, and my uh, assembly district uh, in Compton. Thank you very much for having a vision to bring us all together. Um, I was born and raised in Watts, 
Um, so I represent uh, Watts, Compton, Carson, Wilmington, North Long Beach, Linwood, Gardena, and also a portion of Torrance. So a shout out to everybody who lives in those cities in which I represent. And I hope that, uh, you know, that we'll continue to represent you in the California State Legislature. I, I've been in office in the State Assembly for seven years. I was elected previous to the Carson City Council, almost did 10 years on the Carson City Council. I have a labor background. I work for the California State Board of Equalization. I was a former police officer, the first and last African-American hired in the history of the Maywood Police Department. I chair the Assembly Democratic Caucus right now, which means that I oversee um, the, the caucus agenda for all the Democrats in the State Assembly. The Speaker appointed me the chair of the Select Committee on Police Reform, and I'm happy to report there's about 18 pieces of legislation that now rest on the governor's desk um, that we are waiting with great anticipation for him to sign. He has 30 days to sign that, those 18 pieces of legislation in law to making sure that we reimagine what law enforcement looks like in the state of California, making sure that no one ever have to go through what George Floyd went through, um, Fernand Valenzuela and Santa Ana, making sure that Angelo Quinto and others no longer have to um, face the abuse, the excessive force that law enforcement um, um, inflicts on people in this state of California. So I'm happy to be here and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Wonderful, thank you so much for being here with us. And if we can move to the Q&A slide, wonderful, great. So we'll ask these three different questions um, for our panelists, if you can answer the question within two minutes and we can get through all of them. Uh, we'll start with the first one who will uh, be directed towards each of you. And the first one is, how does your work affect students? And if you can please describe an initiative you have worked on that students would be interested. So board member Ortiz Franklin, let's start with you. Sure. Um, everything I do affects students. Uh, I guess that's the pleasure of us getting to host this conversation with you all. My two biggest jobs are making sure our superintendent is going in the right direction. So giving some policy direction there and passing our budget to make sure we can afford all the things we want to do. Uh, a couple of things we've done recently that I'm very proud of. Our office wrote a digital divide resolution to make sure every student was getting access to um, devices, including Chrome books and hotspots and soon we're purchasing broadband for students who don't have access to uh, hardwired internet at home. I'm really excited looking forward to that. Um, but uh, probably the biggest thing we've done was just last week we passed a mandate for student vaccines. So everybody 12 and up who's eligible for the vaccine will be required to have that vaccine by spring semester. We also passed it for staff. So by um, just a couple of weeks away from now, actually, all of our staff will be vaccinated from COVID-19. Everyone on the call, if you're eligible, I encourage you to get it now. And, you know, these are the kinds of decisions we make to make sure that our students and our school communities are as safe as possible, but also have access to learning throughout this pandemic, but much further into the future. We're happy to share some more information about how those things impact you in the chat. If you have questions, keep them coming. But really, everything we do at the board should impact teaching and learning and the conditions of your classrooms. But we can only do that in collaboration with partners like our supervisors and our assembly members. So it's important to know that many elected officials impact your classroom experience. And I'm glad to hear from my colleagues on, on their responses as well. Thanks, Gabriela. Thank you so much. Assembly member Gibson, if you can also answer that first question for us. Sure. Um, and so for, for me, I think the work, every mostly everything that I do affects um, students in the classroom, where it comes down to, um, you know, funding, um, dealing with um, funding levels within the state of California, money is going from the state to fund. This governor, as well as this legislature has funded education at, the, at its highest level in the state of California, to making sure that during the midst of this pandemic, um, that we uh, have funds to making sure that your facilities are clean, making sure um, that you have all the materials and, and the books and, and things of that nature that you have. It is our responsibility to making sure that we fund education to the highest level. And so when you look at uh, Assembly Bill that I authored, uh, Assembly Bill 520, that helps promote um, bringing in more male teachers of color, because we absolutely realize that when you place a male teacher of color, it helps motivate um, students um, to one day group become a teacher, um, especially young male students 
Um, and so we, we're deliberate in this particular work. Uh, when you look at homelessness, is we have a number of students who are homeless. We put more money, I think $12 billion into the state's budget to address homelessness as well as student um, homelessness because we don't want to make we want to make sure that um, our students are in, a, in a, an environment where it's conducive to learning, making sure that you don't have to worry about where your head is going to be laid. Um, and so it's our responsibility to basically to keep schools going and operating and moving in a direction so that you guys can grow up to be the best and the brightest that California has to offer. Thank you so much for that. Supervisor Mitchell, if we can move on to you to answer that first question. Absolutely. As policymakers, our work falls into three categories. We legislate, we set policy, we appropriate, we set budgets, and we provide oversight. So I'll give you an oversight example. Uh, uh, in the LA Times this past week, a story was written about a RAND survey about suspected gangs in the LA County Sheriff's Department. And so I'm thinking about you all and the number of young people who are in juvenile hall, who've been arrested, who find themselves on the gang injunction or the gang database because of your tattoos. And so it's important that we use our oversight power to hold department heads accountable. Um, the sheriff's department shouldn't have different kinds of privileges that you don't. And so if they have gangs and they have gang related tattoos, we need to look at that very closely. That's an example of oversight. With regard to policy making, you know, some of them directly impact you or impact you indirectly. For example, the work we've done around COVID um, to make sure that you all are safe in returning to school, to make sure that we're providing rent relief to your parents or mortgage relief, um, considering the economic impact COVID has had on our, own, our, our entire communities. Uh, I introduced a bill when I was in the legislature called the Crown Act because black girls are getting suspended from schools across this country, California included, if for based on dress code violations if they wore their hair like mine and locks, twists, or braids. So the Crown Act directly impacted the number of girls and young men who were being suspended from school. And through the budget process, we have both responsibility, I do at the county level of appropriating the budget to make sure that your needs are met. Uh, the LA County Office of Education is the school board that governs kids who are in halls or probation camps. So making sure they have all the resources they need. Um, and then we have discretionary funds. Those are funds that I get to allocate in my district to meet unique and special needs. And so for example, we're launching a new lifeguard training program targeting black and brown kids from 16 to 24 in the second district to bring more of you into the lifeguard programs for LA County. We also funded uh, in partnership with tech.org creating paid internships for a thousand kids across LA County. So the ways in which we can use the overall county budget to support you and your needs or our discretionary funds to target specific programs that benefit our young people. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell. If we can actually stay with you for the second question, um, why is student involvement in the political process so important? And what can students do to get more involved? I appreciate that question. I think students uh, we need to stop underestimating you, but more importantly, you have to stop underestimating yourself. If you think about it, every significant social and political movement throughout our nation's history started with people in your age group. Think about it. Um, in your history books, the Greensboro sit-ins in the 60s, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, the, the Greensboro sit-ins were a group of students who desegregated public eating counters. They were students. Black Lives Matter started with young people. The Parkland students and the March for Our Lives against gun violence. Those are all movements that started with young people. Most of the Black Panthers in the 60s and 70s were 21 and younger when they started organizing. So I don't want you to think, and as adults, we have to recognize that you have power and responsibility to let your voices be heard. So it's not about just waiting to your voting age. You all have got to start your leadership and organizing now, right where you are in your uh, school campuses and let that bleed out into your community. I look to you um, for figuring out the future direction of our city, county, and our state. So just look back at our own history to recognize that students have led every social movement since this nation's founding. 
Thank you so much for that powerful answer. Board member Ortiz Franklin, if, if you can also answer, what can students do to get more involved in the political process? I 100% agree with Supervisor Mitchell that young people have and will continue to lead us into a better future. And that starts with your own leadership and sharing with the adults around you what you need and how we can better serve you. So I think the first election I voted in was in a fifth grade for student council. And if there's any fifth grade student councils here, I can imagine some of you running for a student class president or secretary or treasurer. And I'll tell you the first time I ran I was in eighth grade at Fleming Middle School and I didn't win. I was very sad, but I made posters and advocated to my peers and I learned a lot through that process. Um, though I didn't win uh, eighth grade class president, I was still involved in leadership. And I think that's one of the greatest things our schools can offer is clubs and extracurricular activities, uh, opportunities to exercise your leadership, your voice and share with the adults your ideas and how we can make school and our community is better for you. So I would definitely encourage you all to find things that interest you and uh, consider leadership positions in those areas, because that's really what um, this process is all about is our collective leadership, right? It's not just being the person who has the title, but really getting to serve alongside others so that we all have a better living experience on campuses, but also in our communities. There's a couple questions in the chat about how old you have to be to vote. I just shared with you how you can often vote at your schools, but I'm wondering if students might be interested in this. A couple of years ago, the school board passed a resolution to look into whether 16 and 17 year olds should be able to vote for school board members like me, the person who gets to make a lot of decisions on your behalf. And if you would be interested in having that power and having that voice, I think our office needs to revisit that resolution and find out what's happening there. And is this possible for young people to be involved in voting for us who, who represent you all? And then of course you can also pre-register to vote. So if you're 16 or 17 or when you become 16 or 17, get ready so that as soon as you're 18, your very first election, you are already set up to go. Um, I think that's one of the greatest things our young people can do as well. Thank you for that. And Assembly Member Gibson, if we can move on to you for this last question, how does the Constitution impact your work and affect the lives of students? Uh, the Constitution affects everything that we do. If I want to put forth a piece of legislation that is not constitutional, constitutionally sound. Uh, therefore, I can't put forth that legislation. We have great attorneys to help advise us to making sure that we don't veer off into areas that um, that are not that had a conflict with the Constitution of the State of California or and or the United States of America. And so, uh, it impacts my work. It guides my work. When I come up, or when residents give me uh, ideals on policy ideals. Um, I take that policy ideal with my team and we send it to our ledge council. Our ledge council says that we can do this or we can't do this. If they say we can in fact do this, then we start uh, moving the ball forward by creating a piece of legislation that you know, embodies the, the mission in which we're trying to achieve. So it, it absolutely affects and impact the work that I do. Um, and for, for, for me in terms of students, because I know someone put it, uh, uh, something in the chat a few moments ago, the recall election is tomorrow. So we wanna make sure, um, and I thank you very much for your, for your chat message, the recall election, make sure your parents vote. They have to vote, they got uh, the, the, the ballot in the mail, they need to vote and they need to drop it in the mailbox uh, so it can be postmarked before the, the 14th or take it to a voting location and deposit it there. But Anyway, the Constitution guides all of our work. So I just want to answer the question um, in that way. And, and, and Assemblymember Gibson, why don't we, I looked at the chat too, let's, let's explain a little bit about what the recall election is. You know, the recall election um, is an opportunity for, for voters to basically say they don't want the governor to continue his current term. Right. And the recall um, is a hundred year old law that amended our state's constitution. As we're talking about the constitution, you know, we have the US constitution and the state constitution. And the recall law amended our constitution about a hundred years ago. We also have the power, Mr. Gibson does, members of the state legislature, to amend the constitution. And so 
Sometimes on ballots during the election season, you'll see something called a constitutional amendment where we are attempting to change the constitution or update it based on the current needs of society. And so after this recall election where people will decide, do we want the governor to keep his job or not, which ends tomorrow, there will probably be in the future opportunities for us to amend the state constitution. A lot of people are talking about it, including our secretary of state, because we don't know if that 100 year old law is as helpful today as it may have been 100 years. So you also have an opportunity as a voter to change our constitution at the state level. So that's also the power in voting that you get to change the constitution. And that is what to piggyback on what the supervisor indicated. A lot of the, um, the, uh, the provisions within this constitution, as, she, as the supervisor mate mentions, 100 years old, is not applicable to today's society. And so it has to be updated. I know the Legislative Black Caucus is looking at that and, and going to take that responsibility on uh, because we care about voting rights. We just celebrated in August, uh, this past August last month, we just uh, celebrated 56 years when the Voting Rights Act was actually signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson. Um, and it updated the 15th Amendment in the Constitution of the United States, giving us an unalienable rights to vote in this state uh, that we call the United States of America. If I can just briefly add on, look, we're all interested in this idea, um, but it's important to know that the bosses of elected officials are our voters. So I'm the boss of the superintendent, who's the boss of all the principals, who are the bosses of the teachers, but I'm not at the top. The people who are at the top are the voters. And so every so often, the, the question has also come up about how often we vote. It depends. There are federal elections every four years, some state and federal every two. Sometimes there are local measures that come up. But every time there's an opportunity to vote, the voters are the bosses of the people in these service positions getting to serve you as their elected officials. And so I think that's important to know that the only way we know we're doing a good job is if we serve you well and we get reelected, or maybe we don't get reelected, depending on how well we serve you for the terms that we're elected for. Thank you so much for that um, to all of you. And actually, we're going to just move straight into the student Q&A because there are so many amazing questions that are coming through the chat. Um, and we'll try to get through as many as we can uh, for our panelists. But we'll, we'll start with the first one that I see here. What is voting fraud? And I'll leave this open to anybody who wants to answer. What is voting fraud? I think the shortest uh, explanation of voting fraud is when people cheat. Either you vote more than once, uh, you're not registered uh, to vote and somehow you vote. Um, it's fraud, it's basically like cheating. Um, you know, most of us represent districts, certain geographic areas. And so you get to vote in an election based on where you live. Another example of voting fraud is to register in an area where you don't actually live. You know, democracy is based on representative government. And so if you live in the second district, my district goes from Carson to uh, Pico Fairfax, from Culver City to downtown. If you live in that area, then I represent you. If you register to vote in another area or you register to vote under fake names, so you can vote more than once. Those are examples of voter fraud. It's cheating the system. And I'll just add, it's rare. I know it was in the news a lot a couple of years ago, a real fear of too many people committing voter fraud, but I don't think it happens as often as the news had portrayed this worry that it would happen. The people that I know, and I would ask my, my colleagues on this panel here, I think for the most part vote once, where you're registered, where you live, in every opportunity that you have, and we try to make our voices heard in the most honest way possible. I want to just make sure people know, I think it's very rare that it occurs. Thank you. I'll go move on to the next one. Why do we have to be 18 or older to vote? <laughs> if I can take that one, uh, if I can take that one. So I started out at 16 years of age, where me and my sister uh, protest at Fremont High School uh, because of the, pr the principal was um, not um, distributing um, fairness. And so we protested. But as a result of that protest, I got involved in the youth and government at the YMCA. And at the, as a result of that, I had opportunity to go to, to Sacramento and be part of youth and government 
And as a result of that, we tried to pass a law lowering the age limit to 16 years of age. That bill, um, in terms of law and in terms of youth and government, it was tabled. Um, and then a, a, a former state assembly, a state assembly member, state senator, now uh, LA County or LA City uh, Councilman, um, current price actually tried to change the law so that voters at, can vote at the age of 16 years of age. And so I just try to go through that trajectory to let you know how important it is um, to vote, but also how you can start now. I started at 16 years of age. I think I started before then because I became class president at Charles <laughs> Drew at Charles Drew uh, Junior High School. So I went to Charles Drew, graduate from Charles Drew, graduate from 93rd Street Elementary School and Fremont High School. And so I think that sparked my activism and by me getting involved um, when it comes down to trying to be a change agent um, in my community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And related to that, is voting a right or a responsibility? And I'll leave that open to all three of you. I think that's an excellent question. And I think, you know, different people, uh, I think perhaps have different ideas. You know, um, the US constitution basically guaranteed initially the right to vote to white male land owners. Women got the right to vote years later and people of color got the right to vote years after that. And people died for the fundamental right to vote. So I believe it is a right and yet it's a here. responsibility that we must take seriously. I see a lot of questions asked about, you know, how many um, elections are there per year? I think people sometimes think voting is a burden. They think their vote doesn't count. And people have this notion about, quote, they don't trust government. Well, you've heard us talk about the kinds of decisions we have the power to make in government that impact your everyday life. For example, it was a state bill that passed that set the driving age at 16. It's bills that pass that determine the price of gas. It was bills that passed that required that you have uh, um, auto insurance in order to drive legally. So if those are issues that impact your everyday life, you need to understand that there, you have the power to put people in place at the city council level, the state legislature or the White House that have the power to make those kinds of decisions that impact you. That's why it really is your responsibility to weigh in. We're public servants. We serve the public. And so you have a responsibility to communicate to us your wishes and desires about what you want for your community. And you do that through voting, however many elections there are per year. Somebody asked how many voting centers there were in the US. Well, I can't tell you the US, but I can tell you for LA County. For the election that's taking place now, because we have what we call early voting, tomorrow is the deadline to vote. We have 253 vote centers throughout the uh, LA County. Just um, Saturday, for example, 21,000 voters were processed by people actually going in to vote in person. But you can vote by mail. You can turn in your ballot at these bright yellow and blue drop boxes all across LA County where you can turn it in. Or you can vote in person at one of these 253 in-person voting centers. Here, here. I would just agree. I think it's both a right and a responsibility. And in part, I say that because my mom immigrated to this country and didn't earn her citizenship until many, many years after being here. And because she wasn't a citizen when she was younger, she wasn't able to vote. But because I was born in this country, I was able to vote as soon as I turned 18. And I did. I went to college in New York City, but I voted in California because I decided at 17 to pre-register and to be a permanent vote by mail voter, which now now everyone can do since the pandemic. So yes, I hang on to my stickers every single time. I wear them proudly because I know there are so many people, not just across history, but even today, who wish they could vote. Non-citizens, children, people who, for a variety of reasons, maybe past incarceration, are unable to express their voice through the voting process. So I feel like it is absolutely both my right and my responsibility to be able to vote in every election. I saw a question that was like, what if you mess up? Voting is so important that if you make a mistake on your ballot, you can get another ballot. The government wants to make sure that your voice is heard and that it's accurate so that we're getting all the right information to make the best decisions for all of the people in the U.S. So I love that question. Thank you for asking it. I just want to follow up, and I agree with Supervisor Mitchell with respect to it's a vote, it's a right. Um, when you look at um, not only my parents, but 
you know, just the people who have fought in order to have uh, level the playing field, just to balance and create equity, um, just to have the right in order to know and choose who they want to elect um, them at, as a city council member or mayor or state assembly member or senate. You have the right now that was guaranteed in the 15th amendment. You have a right um, by the, the, the stroke of the pen by President Lyndon Johnson of August of 1965 to vote in this country and to be treated as an equal. Makes no difference if you own land or not. That's the way it used to be. Makes no difference of the color of your skin. That's the way it used to be. And so that's what we're fighting for even come Tuesday, even come tomorrow, is making sure that we have these rights that makes us and set us apart from any other country on the planet. There is no country um, on the planet that gives you each individual more rights than the United States of America. And I'm happy to be here, happy to have been born here because it recognized a woman's right to choose. It recognized, you know, um, even in California, what school you want to go to or where you want to live be because before there was certain areas, if you were black or brown, you couldn't live in certain areas in California. And so these laws that I'm entrusted and the authority that I'm entrusted with, I try to make sure that it's, it's, it's that I want to be what Mahandi Gandhi said, I want to be a, a change that I want to see. And so that's the reason why I got involved into what this thing uh, called public service, not politics, but public service. And that's a great responsibility. Someone asked a question real quick, how often do you vote? Well, um, if, you are, if you live in a city, it's probably once every four years you vote for the mayor, city council, and depends on if it's odd and even. If you run if, for your state assembly member, it's once every two years. For the state senator, it's once every four years. Congress is once every two years. United States um, um, Senate, it's once every six years that you vote. So we're voting to making sure, and school board members, it's, I think it's once every four years as well. So we're voting to make sure that you stay not only educated, but also participating in the process as you exercise your right to vote, because it, it is your right. There are lots of questions about, do you have to be a citizen to vote? So could we um, respond to that? Yes, um, absolutely. I actually would have wanted to see if Christelle, you wanted to ask your question directly to the panelists. As you, you put in that question in the chat. Crystal. Yes. Would you ask your question about citizenship to the panelists? Yes. Um, do we have to be, do we have to be citizens or can we be immigrants? Or do you have to be citizens to vote or can we be immigrants too? That's a really important question. I'm really glad you asked that. One of the rights of citizenship is the right to vote. Now, you don't have to have been born here. You can be a naturalized citizen mm -hmm. and earn the right to vote. Uh, another rule that we've changed is it used to be if you had been gone to jail, and you've been convicted of a felony, you could lose your right to vote. But here in California in November, um, the voters voted. We changed the Constitution and say, and we have reinstated the right to vote for people who may have gone to jail, they were convicted felons, but upon their release, when they come back into our neighborhoods, they now again have the right to vote. But you do have to be a citizen. You can either be a uh, native born or a naturalized citizen to have the right to vote. Thank you for that. And are, do you all have any recommendations for, for people who may come from immigrant families who cannot vote? How can they still get involved in the political process? Well, I would start by saying, you know, you all are the influencers in your household. I know the role, the power I had as an influencer in my household with my family. And I know the power my son has with me in terms of influencing my way of thinking. And so you should know you know, many people lived in kind of mixed status households. You have friends and families or adults, you know, uh, in your life. And so it's really important that you share your experience today. You have had the opportunity to spend time with three elected officials at three levels of government, the county, school board, and the state. And so you should share the, some of the things you learned that we talked about today. 
and you have the power to influence other people voting. You can talk to your parents or your grandparents or uh, the other adults in your life, your older siblings who may be like, yeah, I'm 18, but I'm busy. You can talk to them about voting by mail, um, that it's early voting. They don't have to wait till tomorrow. So even though you may not have the right to vote yet or have um, immigrant family, friends and neighbors who haven't, don't have the right to vote, you should use your power of influence to convince people how important that act is. Yep. I would also add, you can volunteer. You can volunteer on a campaign or at a voting center. You can join different clubs and organizations that try to encourage people to vote in a particular way if you agree with that way. There are lots of ways to get involved if you're unable to vote to help others who can vote make sure they exercise that right and responsibility. Thank you so much. So we only have a couple minutes left and I definitely want to have the students have the opportunity to ask more questions directly to our panelists. So if students have any more questions, can they raise their virtual hand um, to ask a question before we end our q and I'll just give a couple seconds for that to happen. And Marilyn, I can't see who's raised their hand. Has anybody raised their there, hand? Yes, we have Henry and then uh, Royces. Uh, I think there's like six or seven people. We might not get to all of them. So maybe let's do Henry and then Royces. Um, Go ahead. Um, if terrorists become citizens or if terrorists, they live or they're from other countries and they live here for a long time um, and they become citizens would it be right or do they have to do they have to have a background check well you know i think in my opinion it depends on how you define quote unquote a terrorist i think you know uh, when we look at the people who stormed the u.s capitol january 6 um you know white supremacists people who are racist and and don't um, 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 support policies that help people of color, you know, that, that's a form of terrorism too. Um, and so I think it depends on how you define what a terrorist is. But if someone goes through the process to become a citizen, I saw someone ask, yes, there is a test, there are classes you have to take um, to become a citizen. Um, there, you have to take a pledge that you are pledging your allegiance to this country. You know, the Pledge of Allegiance we say every day in class, you take a pledge of allegiance to this country when you, sub, when you become a citizen. And yes, 9-11 was, was horrific. And I don't know that any of those people who are responsible for 9-11 were actual citizens. They lived in this country, uh, uh, but I don't know that they were citizens. So I think we really have to ask the question about who is truly committed to the principles of um, um, justice and liberty and justice for all, whether you are black or brown or you immigrated to this country. Uh, those are the kinds of questions we have to ask ourselves. Um, um, but if someone goes through the entire process, takes the classes, pass the tests, to become a citizen, they have the right to vote. Absolutely. And I know um, Supervisor Mitchell has to head out a bit early. I just want to thank her so much for joining us and for joining the students. And Assemblymember Gibson and I are going to stick around and answer a couple more questions before we play a fun game. But thank you, Holly. Thank you, Supervisor Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you. Well. OK, can we ask Royces to unmute themselves and ask their question? Can we take Hello? the background off so we can see the faces? Can we take? Um, Great, thanks. Wow, look at all these students. Do you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Royces, go ahead. Oh, um, a question. How often do we have elections? A month, a year, or years? How often do we have elections? Well, if so, if, if you're running for, if you are uh, voting for a city council member, it's once every four years. Um, if you if you are voting for a state assembly member, 
It's uh, once every two years, Senate, you know, uh, California State Senate, it's once every four years. For Congress, it's once every two years. So Congress, which is the lower house, the State Assembly, which is the lower house, we run once every two years. The upper house, which is the State Senate and the United States Senate, the United States Senate, because it's unique, it, they, they, they run once every six years. But for our California State Senate, it's once every four years. And if you're board, on the Board of Supervisors, like Holly Mitchell is on the Board of Supervisors, it's once every four years. Um, and that can also be for mayors of cities once every four years, school board members um, once every four years. Um, and so if you're looking at voting in those areas, then as I described, those are the years um, that you served. Did I leave anybody, any elected out? No, I was just going to say an easy way to remember is at least every two years there is an election, but there might be more elections than every two years. Like tomorrow's is a special election that wouldn't otherwise have been calendared if it wasn't for this one thing we're voting on. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question, Roises. Um, next we have, and so sorry if I, I'm mispronouncing your name, um, Denko Ravil, if they can unmute themselves to ask their question. Uh, that's not my name. Okay, uh, yeah. go ahead. Uh, uh, my question is, what if like there was two sides of something and they have like an equal vote, like both of them have the same vote of pe of like people voting? Like what would happen? It's a good question. For example, I'll say for the school board, there are seven of us. So there's never going to be an even vote unless for some reason one person can't participate. And then it would be three versus three. And we would ask our superintendent to help us weigh in. And sometimes what I've seen happen is people will change their mind because they're forced to make a decision. An easy example is like Congress, where there are 100 members. If it's 50 and 50, then our vice president breaks the tie. So different Different government agencies have different rules about who breaks the tie. Right. And if you look at the state assembly, there are 80 members that's like me in the state assembly. And so um, we never get to a tie, even though it could be 40-40. Um, and in this regard, um, if you're looking at Democrats versus Republic, then chances are because we have a super, super majority in the state assembly, um, we can pass legislation with 60 votes because there's 60 Democrats uh, in the state assembly. But in the state Senate, there are 40 state senators. Um, it's different from Congress and the United States Senate. Um, um, but in the Senate, in California State uh, Senate, is 40 members. But the majority in that house are Democrats. So we can control both houses, if that makes sense. Great. So we only have time for two more questions. So the next person we're going to go to is Arleth. If she can unmute them herself and ask her question. Is there um, certain rules um, voters have to follow? It's a good question. And um, I think it depends on which state and county you're in. In California, we try to make it as easy as possible for everyone who's eligible to vote. But you might have heard in some other states, they're trying to implement some rules and restrictions that make it harder to vote. Like in some states, you have to show your ID to vote. And that's a rule we don't have in California, but it makes it harder for people to vote. So it depends on where you are. Um, but it's, it's a really good question. And I would say there are advocates. There are those of us who want voting to be as easy as possible, who want as few rules as possible so that more voices can be heard. Um, it's a really tricky one, though. It's a really good question. Okay, let's move on to Emmanuel, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I have a question. When you vote, where do the votes go to? Can someone repeat the question? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, when 
When you vote, what would the votes go to? Did you say when you vote, who do the votes go to? Uh, yeah. When you, when you vote. Oh, so when you vote, when you vote, the election official is responsibility is to count those votes. <clears throat> and then they have people working with them, opening envelopes, um, counting each ballot, recounting each ballot to making sure that when they announce how many votes a particular person has or a particular initiative or proposition, that they are counting accurately. And so the election official, it could be your city clerk, it could be the county registrar's office, it could be the secretary of state. Those individuals have the right to count the ballots, certify the election and announce the results of those elections. So tonight, everyone's homework assignment will be to watch as much of the, of the news, because this is national news, that will take place on the recall, right? We are, we are uh, hoping that this governor stays in office, but the election official, which will be the state um, secretary of state, will be counting, will be opening up the envelopes and will be posting the results as they get them. And so your homework tonight is to uh, watch um, and see what you feel about the process. CNN will be carrying it, all of our local news media will be carrying this. Um, um, this is a timely discussion because the, the recall is taking place tomorrow. And so we need you to engage and see what you think about the process. Thank you so much. I think, oh, you are so smart. Assembly member Gibson, everybody loves your bow tie. Amazing. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no problem. I'll teach you how to, I'll teach you how to tie one if you want to learn. Oh, I love that. <laughs> well, we only have six minutes left and we did want to take the students through a civics quiz. So I'm going to ask Mark if he could unmute himself and share his screen. And maybe we can just go through a couple of questions with the students before we leave about a minute or two to talk about our Constitution in the Classroom program that we want to offer to teachers and students to learn more about these issues that we just talked about. Of course, yeah. Thank you, Gabriella. Appreciate it. Again, thank you, panelists and students for your participation. Uh, so what we want to do is, Marilyn, if you wouldn't mind sharing uh, the slide and going to the slide with the um, with the URL in it. Um, I will also, if someone, there we go, perfect. So what we want to do is click on the uh, URL that is there and then select multiplayer. Uh, the multiplayer button there, exactly as you see it, and then put 7854 in the game code, and then your handle should be student. So this is a program that you can use at home, um, and what we want to do is, as Gabriella said, engage in this short voting rights quiz so we can answer some questions that you may have about the details of voting in California, and you know maybe you can even educate some of the adults in your life. Uh, so I will go ahead and share my own screen. All right, so everybody should be able to see this just in case you can't access it on your own. And what we wanna do is I will basically do a call and response. I'll give you the question and then if people could uh, write in the chat what they think the response is and uh, we'll go over the right answer and again, learn some details about uh, voting in California. So the first question is, in California, voters are required to show some type of ID when they vote at the polls. What do people think? Is that true or is that false? All right, seeing some true, a lot of false. So this is actually false. So in California, you are not required to show any ID uh, when you go to the polls. Um, so in most cases, you're not required to show an ID. If you're voting for the first time, this is an important qualification after registering to vote by mail and you didn't provide like a driver's license number or other identification number at that time, then you may be required to show it. Again, this is just if you're voting for the first time and you didn't show this information when you registered. So this is like a situation that might come up. Again, the adults in your lives may ask the question, um, but that's the one exception in California to keep in mind.
So the next question you should see on your screen is politicians don't pay attention to issues that are important to me because young people don't vote at the same rate as older Americans. Uh, so what do you guys think? Is that true or false? I hope you heard from some elected officials today about how important your voice is. So I'd be curious <laughs> if the answer on the quiz matches what we would think. <laughs> it's a good, good, good point, good point. So if, so kind of the question is like, what do the, what rate do uh, young people and old people vote at? And the correct answer is that generally speaking, older people vote at higher rates uh, than younger people. And as a result, some elected officials pay more attention to priorities of older voters because uh, they have more of an influence on uh, what, uh, who are voted into office. And so, as I think has been really driven home during this presentation, it's so important that young people become involved in the political process because that's how your vote, uh, how your voice is heard. So I'll just go through one more question and uh, then we can move on to more information about the Constitution in the Classroom program. And again, this is a, a program that you can use at home whenever you want. Just if you are interested in learning more about California voting or a variety of other topics. Uh, so this question is, in California, if I forget to register by the registration cutoff date, I cannot vote in the next election. What do people think? Is this true or false? All right, seeing a lot of false. It is false. So uh, in California, you can still vote even if you haven't registered by election day. You just need to take one more step. You need to uh, go to a voting registration center and you can vote there. Uh, it's known as conditional voter registration uh, and it's a safety net for people who missed the deadline, you know, aren't able to vote or aren't, aren't able to register uh, before election day. Um, so on election day, you go to a polling place and uh, I think it already has been shared polling place a lookup tool and uh, you can register to vote on the day of or the deadline to vote in the election, which as people have said many times uh, for the recall is tomorrow. So, and I think that with that, we'll finish with the, um, the quiz part portion of this presentation, but thank you everyone for being so involved. I really appreciate it. Um, and I will actually hand it over to Indira if you want to just say a few words about our constitution in the classroom program. Yeah, sure. Very quickly. Uh, if you'd like to have a lawyer or a law student come and do a lesson in the classroom on the Constitution or some part of the Constitution, please send me an email um, and we can arrange for that. It can be by Zoom or it can be in person. Um, so there's a lot of enthusiastic uh, lawyers and law students here uh, that would love to be able to teach folks more about the Constitution. Thank you so much. And we just dropped her um, email into the chat. Thank you so much for, for everybody for attending. And board member Franklin Ortiz, I'll hand it back to you to close us out. Thanks. I just wanted to thank all of our schools, our scholars, our educators for joining us today to talk about the importance of voting. Tomorrow is an election, but every two years you have the opportunity and we will put our contact information in the chat because like I said, my whole job is serving you. So if you have good ideas, share them with us. We have student listening sessions, a student advisory board, and lots of opportunities to elevate your voice. I actually have a board meeting tomorrow too, where we listen to public comments. So Please stay in touch, stay involved, encourage everyone who can to vote or get involved in the political process. You all are amazing. I can't wait to see how you lead us into the future. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great rest of your Monday, everyone. And the thank you to thing, ACS. Yeah, oh, the ahead, last, yeah, the last thing I'll say is just teachers, if you filled out the registration and if you put your name down that you were interested in a lesson, we will follow up with you. Our friends at ACS will follow up with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Assemblymember Gibson. It was so great to have you with us today. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.